Hello guys and dolls, welcome back to Honey Badger 3D Print and Paint. Today, the Sidewinder X4 Pro. But before we get started, roll those credits and a word from our sponsor. PCBWay are proud sponsors of the channel. They offer industry-leading 3D printing services covering all types of materials and processes. They also offer industry-leading online CNC machine services from milling, machining, and turning in all the materials you could possibly need. They also offer a fully online prototyping PCB service. Everything from assembly through to design, you can do it all online with an easy system to use for quality. So for all of your needs, check out PCB Way in the link in the video description. So the Cartesian is dead. That's what everybody tells you. But if you're not buying a bamboo at this point, then there's no point in you 3D printing. All of these should go in the bin. Have artillery managed to revive or at least sustain the status quo to mean that buying a Cartesian in 2024 still makes sense. Let's cut through, we'll, we'll get to some of the, we'll get to some of the prints that we've done and some of the larger prints that we've done as well. Why would you want a Cartesian rather than a Core XY? There's really only two reasons. One, they're cheaper, and two, they are fundamental, they are generally larger printers. This is the X4 Pro. This is 300 by 300 by 400. To be clear, if you want to get that in a Core XY, then you need to be going for, say, a Voron, which is about 1,200 pounds, or a Rat Rig V Core, which it starts at about sort of 800 pounds up. Um, there's not a lot of Core XYs that are giving you that 300, 300, 400. Um, you could take, for example, the K1 Max. Um, that, again, similar build volume, but this is a higher Z. And that starts at about £900 as well. For this, you're looking at $429 US right now. This is clipperized. This has input shaper. This has auto bed leveling. It has all the features that you would want but you're not paying an absolutely brutal price tag. Now, for those of us who are very privileged um, and we get sent machines, Core XY is obviously the area that we lean into because it's quicker and it's cheaper and you know we the price doesn't really matter from our perspective because we're sent those machines. But that's not an option for everybody, right? It's not, it's not you can't just say throw more money at a situation and that, that's just, that's the solution to get better stuff. Um, I'll talk through some of the features and uh, some of the things that this thing has got, uh, and then we'll move on to taking a look at some of the prints that we've got off of this. As you can see, we're about halfway through an Athena statue. So this is for a commission job that we're doing, and the Sidewinder really has done all of this. You can see it's done it in a variety of filaments. It's a real hodgepodge. We've been sort of trying to use up all the extra stuff that we've had laying around. Um, it's done a really good job. So features. So as we already said, it's a 300 by 300 by 400 build volume. You do get a filament runout sensor. You get dual Z motors as well as dual Z lead screws. You get linear rails on the X and on the Y, and it's dual linear rails on the Y. The claim on Artillery's website is they're getting 500 millimeters a second. That fundamentally isn't true, but it is still quick. Um, we've done all the prints we've done here at about 150, um, and I find that's pretty much the sweet spot where you can get about as much speed as you can before you start to compromise on its ability to park cool or its ability to, um, to, to sort of keep up with extrusion. It does have an all-metal volcano hot end, um, gone are the flat ribbon cables of the previous um, artillery generation. I do think that's a little bit of a shame. They were a little bit, not iconic, because that probably makes it sound a bit more than it actually was, but when you thought of a Sidewinder, and we had Sidewinders, the X1 and the X2, for quite a number of years, they were our workhorses. Um, when, you, when you think of a Sidewinder, genuinely you thought of those flat ribbon cables, but they had drawbacks, they did occasionally fail, 
they weren't necessarily the best way to have implemented it. So they've moved to this click in connector. Um, it's super secure, it doesn't move. I will say that what I would love to have seen is, and I can't believe I have to ask for this in this day and age, but a drag chain, people. They're not expensive. Route your cables properly, put them in a drag chain. When I'm talking about that, I'm thinking of things like the CRM4, uh, for example, um, or when we're talking about, again, Core XY, so the Voron, the artillery and all of that, all of the things are vet routed through a drag chain. It looks so much better. You reduce the cable strain. It's much, much better. As it is, we've had to tie ours up with this bit here because the, the end of this tends to sort of waft around the bottom and it ends up dragging over and, and, and hitting your prints when you're doing a large print. I have had that happen on this. That's why this is tied up. Um, it's not okay. So not, not, not at this point of design, right? There's so many thoughts and people who've been over this design. I can't believe that's something they thought was genuinely acceptable. Um, what we used to do on our machines is we got an ID badge holder, one of the tr retractable ones. You couple it up here, you put it up there, and it means that this is always under tension to be pulled up, but it can go up and down as the printer needs to. I don't like the way they've done it on this. I don't like it. Um, but other than that, we've got carbon effect bracing um, Z braces. They, uh, they work really well. Again, this can do about 150 to 200 millimeters a second when it's printing. It's not slow, right? When we, used, when we were talking about our X1s or the X2, really 50 to 80 millimeters a second was about all you could realistically hope for. Same with Prusa Mark III's. Um, this is now comfortably printing at 150 to 200. I think that's about what you should expect from a Cartesian. Yes, there's probably some profile tuning you can do and tweaking acceleration just a little bit and jerk control inside a clipper that's going to mean that you could push this just that little bit further. Um, but let's be honest, 200 millimeters a second is more than enough for most people to print most things at. Um, and it did all of this, um, all of this model was done at 150. It's done a really nice job. The part cooling can keep up really nicely. You're not stressing the machine and throwing stuff about. Um, the biggest issue I actually found with trying to push things further was actually the, um, was actually the Y axis. So the belt is nice and tensioned and it's got these two chunky uh, Y axis uh, linear rails, but be honest and say that after you, when you started to crank up the acceleration and the travel um, speed, it was the bed that was layer shifting rather than the tool head. A um, little bit of a shame. I think you probably could tweak the profile a little bit. You could maybe push it to about 250. I think any more than that, and you're just you're just not getting 500. Like you're just not. Um, so uh, so I was really happy with how that printed. Before we move on to build quality, it does also have a bed leveling sensor, and it also has a uh, resonance compensator, so it can also do input shaper. It's a solid machine. Oh, and as well, they have put in uh, a really useless drawer. Um, so that's nice, I guess. Uh, bed strain relief was an issue on the X1. They solved it on the X2. They've gone with exactly the same design on this one, the X4. Um, nice, flat, strong ribbon cable, that, or strong, um, strong insulated cable. Not really going to be an issue there. One thing I will say is that they have removed, or at least they seem to have removed, the AC heated bed. This bed, not fast to heat up. Really isn't. And actually... That was one of the good features about the X1 and the X2. They had SSRs and they had AC heated beds and they heated really quickly. And this one doesn't. The hot end heats super quickly, that's great, but they've removed a feature. I don't know why. It was much, much better when you had a silicon heated bed. This one takes ages, it's annoying. We've also got a uh, spring steel magnetic bed, nice and easy to remove. Um, Got locator screws at the back, so you always make sure you're putting it back in the same place. There's also a wipe pad at the back here. That works pretty well. The touch screen is fine. It's not gonna win any awards. It, it does its job. It's a relatively basic interface. Frankly, if you've got this machine, I'd highly recommend you connect it to your network and you use Clipper um, to control anything on the web. And then again, you use it to, um, to send prints to anyway. 
It has got a USB type A port at the front, so you can put normal thumb drives in to send files. Um, it does not have the printer style of, uh, of USB. It has a type C if you want to connect it directly to your PC. Although, just to be clear, I wouldn't ever recommend that you really print that way. USB is super unreliable, especially in Windows. Um, and, then, uh, and then it doesn't have an SD card slot. So it is either thumb drive, direct connect to PC, or uh, using Clipper to, uh, to send things wirelessly. We connected this to Orca Slicer. We had to create our own profile. It wasn't great. Um, there isn't currently a stock profile for Orca Slicer for this. There is one for Prusa Slicer. It works pretty well. Everything here was all sliced in Prusa Slicer, sent over the network, really easy actually pretty good. This doesn't have any remote monitoring on it, so you can't view a webcam or anything like that. But again, just go and look at it. It's not really the end of the world. Um, and, uh, and yeah, all in all, I'm actually really happy with the machine. So let's take a look at some of the prints. Right, so this is the 3D print test. The overall front finish is really, really good. The surface finish is fine bear in mind this is done at a 0.2 layer height so some of the text doesn't come out you can see on the right corner here you've got a little bit of stringing in between there that this is done on the prusa profile um i think you probably could if you edited retraction you could probably get that quite nice to be honest but you know we just we just went with the stock profile the bridging is really nice Park cooling wise, so park cooling, you're all okay up to about 60 degrees on the uh, on the extreme test and about 60 again on the gradual with a weird little blemish. I don't know if you can see. Hold on. There we go. That you can just see there. The overhang tank's pretty normal, to be fair. Like I'm not I'm not super duper broken up about about how that came out and they say that the extrusion there is really consistent and quite nice we've got a vase mode vase this was done at 200 millimeters a second uh, at 0.2 layer height in vase mode and the extrusion is really good we have tested this it is watertight so the, the extrusion is nice and consistent now when it comes to athena so Athena is many, many parts. Here we go. And also a lot of different filaments. She's come out really, really nicely, I think. Um, there is definitely some, uh, this was cut up in Luban. And I'm honest, if I'm honest, I'm not a lover of the program, but it is about the easiest one to use. Just the results can be a little inconsistent sometimes. You can see here that on the face, if we zoom right in there, there we go, look at that. So you can see that this has actually printed really quite nicely. The surface finishes are nice and consistent, which is what we want to see. The overhangs on this have printed pretty well. Just some little issues where sometimes they're not lining up properly. So I went a bit conservative on the um, on the key size. So the key tolerance I put up to 0.4, and I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, it's meant that there's a bit too much play in the keys. But overall, once this gets filled and primed, this I think will come out really nicely. There's a whole bottom piece to this, but we're doing that on the Quiddy Q1 Pro. So this has come out really, really good. Nice. So, as you can see, the print quality is actually really good. Everything here was printed at a 0.2 layer height, and as I said, 
almost everything was printed at 150 to 200. It was 200 millimeters a second for this, 150 for the um, uh, 3D print test, and everything for, um, for Athena has been done at 150 as well. I found that if you pushed it much past 150, the part calling started to struggle. The flow rate wasn't a problem, so if you're doing things like this, where you've just got sort of, you've got minor overhangs, but it's, you know, it's a vase mode or something, you can push it a little bit faster. Um, past 200, and I started to see my Y belt slip, and I was getting some layer shifts. So, um, so 150 is where this machine is super comfortable. Prints lovely all day. Score wise, this is actually a bargain, right? This is under 400 pounds. 300 by 300 by 400, you get clipper, you get all linear rails, you get direct drive, you get a filament sensor, you get a brace kit. Like this is most of the community mods that people did. I'll say I'm a little annoyed at the fact that we don't have an AC heated bed. I really would have liked to have seen that. Um, and maybe I'd have liked to have seen an integrated webcam so I could do time lapses, but you're yeah, pushing into more expensive machines at that point. So I get why it doesn't have one. I think for this price, um, I think this is a really solid machine. I'd give it an eight and a half out of 10. Um, I dislike it when companies say you can print at a speed that you just can't. You cannot print at 500 millimeters a second on this. You can't. So, um, so I wish they wouldn't say things like that. Um, I'd like to see an AC heated bed. The time it takes for this bed to heat up is kind of annoying. Um, it's kind of sort of, you send the files and you just live with the fact that it takes a little bit of time to boot up and off it goes. Um, it's definitely better than the X2. It's proof that the Cartesian framework is not dead. This is still a very, very capable, very serviceable machine. If you had this, you wouldn't be super disappointed or doing modifications. You'd get this out of the box, put it together. You'd be very happy with the machine that you had. Should you go and buy one? That depends. If, if you need the build volume, you're not super duper precious about the advertised speeds, um, then yeah, I think you really should. If you don't need the Z and you've got the extra money to spend, personally, I'd probably go and buy a K1 Max because I've been using my Creality K1 Max for a while now. I'm really, really happy with it. 300 by 300 by 300 is an ample build volume for most of the stuff that I do. You can see that this has already been cut up into multiple parts. So to be fair, like I don't need a super high Z to be able to do this. Um, I, I would be inclined to say that you probably don't need all 400 of the Z, but you may be printing other stuff, right? Um, the linear rails are a really nice addition. It's a super rigid, capable machine. You won't be sad if you buy it. You just won't be printing at sort of bamboo speeds and things like that. So that's the video. Thank you very much for joining us. Let us know in the comments if you guys have got one. Um, as soon as there are Orca Slicer profiles available, I would immediately switch over to Orca Slicer. I'm not really a massive fan of Prusa Slicer's layout, um, but, uh, but as there's already one on Prusa Slicer, I challenge there probably will be one on Orca Slicer fairly soon. It'll just be a community one rather than one created for and by Artillery. Thanks very much. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you on the next video.